A Musical Life with Pulitzer Prize winning composer Jennifer Higdon. Jennifer Higdon is one of the most performed living American composers today. She taught herself to play the flute at the age of 15, wrote her first composition when she was 21, then eventually went on to win the Pulitzer Prize for her violin concerto in 2010. She recently completed her first opera, Cold Mountain, which was premiered by the Santa Fe Opera in 2015 and is being performed in Philadelphia this week. This episode of A Musical Life is brought to you by The Shop at A Musical Life. Visit amusicallife.com forward slash shop to purchase music featured in the show episodes, as well as books and digital accessories for musicians. Once again, that link is amusicallife.com forward slash shop. Welcome to A Musical Life. I'm Hugh Sung. Jennifer Higdon and I have known each other since we were classmates at the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia. Over the years, it's been such an honor and a delight to perform so many of her works. Uh, In fact, I even helped her record her very first album, Rapid Fire, way back in 1995. Despite all the well-deserved accolades Jennifer has received for her incredible compositions, she remains one of the sweetest, most genuine and down-to-earth persons I know. Let's listen to an excerpt from one of her most popular works, Blue Cathedral, as performed by Robert Spano and the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. Jennifer, thank you so much for being on the show. It's good to be here, Hugh. (laughs) You have an insane schedule. We were just talking about this right before we started this. And (laughs) I cannot believe you have been going nonstop and haven't had any vacation until uh, since uh, last May. Is that right? That's right. Absolutely. But you know what? It's all good stuff. It's worth going ahead and kind of pressing forward. (laughs) Well, I, I, I hope you're looking. I know you're looking forward to your vacation starting tomorrow. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I'm kind of actually crawling towards the vacation at this point. (laughs) uh, 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 Well, hopefully we can send you off in in good spirits. But thanks again for for being on the show. Sure. (laughs) For folks who have never heard your music before or contemporary classical music in general, what piece of yours would you recommend that they start listening to to get a sense of your musical language and sound world? And if you don't mind, if you could also share some stories of how those particular pieces came about, that would be great. Absolutely. Um, I think probably the number one piece that people come to my music first is Blue Cathedral, Mm. which is the orchestra work that uh, Curtis commissioned for its 75th anniversary. So it premiered actually in, I believe it was 2000, at the end of the school year. And not long after that, the Atlanta Symphony picked it up and recorded it. Robert Spano had just started his tenure with the Atlanta Symphony and that orchestra has a contract with uh, Telarc, the, the record label, although now I guess it's not really a record label, um, maybe a CD label. I'm not sure what they call it now. But because of that recording, that piece gets scheduled with a lot of orchestras. So for many people, their first experience with my music is through that piece. Uh, we have probably anywhere between 20 and 40 orchestras that do it every year. Oh, my goodness. Wow. All, all over the world. So and usually every weekend someone is doing Blue Cathedral. So I find that that piece is probably the best intro to my music. It's a tone poem. It's about 12 minutes long. It's very colorful. It uses the orchestra. And it has some very unusual sounds in it. For instance, I use water glasses, crystal glasses, in the... Uh, 
the end to kind of a, have an ethereal sort of quality and also these little Chinese reflex bells, which <laughs> they're usually like, I think we have, we ship off 20, 25 boxes to every orchestra. <laughs> you, <places>. you, <laughs> <laughs> you actually ship those Chinese reflex balls yourself? We do. Yeah, I know. So I get a lot of exercise because I live up <laughs> these six steps. So <laughs> FedEx knows me well because I'm always sending these boxes out. They're pretty heavy uh, too. They're metal. So it's quite a bit of weight. <laughs> But if I, had I known how much this piece was going to get played, it's been done like 500 times at this oh point. Oh, my goodness. If I had any idea, I think I probably would have left those bells out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, want, I actually want to touch on the story, the background of Blue Cathedral a little bit later on. But are there any other works that you can recommend? Yeah, you know, my pieces tend to be fairly friendly uh, for... For people who are coming to my music, my violin concerto is another one. Hilary Hahn recorded that for Deutsche Grammophon, and that's the piece that won the Pulitzer Prize. Mm. And it has been an extraordinarily popular CD. Um, and that and my percussion concerto, if someone's more into rock and roll, the percussion concerto is probably a good way to go. That was recorded by Colin Curry, the percussionist I wrote the piece for. Uh, in the London Philharmonic, they have it on a recording that has done really well. That recording actually won a Grammy. It has sold so many discs. So for people who like rock and roll and want to experience classical music, that might be a good kind of entree in. <laughs> It's interesting, you actually started music quite late relative to many other musicians. You know, some pianists or violinists, they start when they're three or four, but you actually started teaching yourself to play the flute at the age of 15. I know. And what it's, is, it's, yeah. It's what, mutual, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, in some ways, it's more remarkable. What inspired you to take up the flute? You know, there was interesting thing. When I was young, I always did something creative, but it wasn't music. We had a lot of uh, visual arts in our household. My dad was a visual artist. And so I did a lot of things like little experimental films with an eight millimeter film camera, basically doing claymation, a oh, lot cool. of drawing and even little short story writing. But I had always been attracted to music and had been very aware that music is a very powerful medium. And I can actually remember having that thought when I was young, as young as five or six, believe it or not. I don't know what prompted the thought, but in my household, we didn't really have classical music. It was a lot of rock and roll that was playing. I was going to ask you, though, what kind of things did you listen to when you were growing up? Rock and roll, anything else? Or did yeah, you have any, fa any favorite bands? I think it was like 60s rock and folk <laughs> music. So like... The Beatles were probably the primary soundtrack in our household. And that came about because the Sgt. Pepper's album, when it came out, has the most incredible album cover I think has probably ever been made with all these characters from history along with the Beatles themselves kind of buried in the texture. My dad bought the album because he's an artist and he thought it would be cool to really like look at examine the cover. So he took the cover and gave my brother and myself <laughs> the album and the LP, we listened to it so many times. But he also, because my dad worked at home as a commercial artist, he often had music playing. And sometimes it was the radio, but sometimes it was like eight-track recordings of like Bob Dylan, the basement tapes, um, a little bit of reggae, the early days of Bob Marley, but also Peter, Paul, and Mary, some of the folk scene, uh, the Kingston Trio, which were popular towards the beginning of the 60s. And so it's whatever basically was playing in the household. That's what I picked up on. So classical music wasn't really present. I think my mom had a recording of Debussy. It was uh, an electronic version of Debussy. <laughs> um, Tomita or something like that. And mm. it was basically some of Debussy's piano preludes that have been arranged in an, in an electronic form. The early versions of electronics. Um, I don't know how they did it. I've sometimes kind of wondered... Now, knowing what I know, I'm like, we didn't have digital electronics. So that means these guys had to make use a tape machine and actually splice these things together, which is yeah. a very labor intensive process. Yeah, those early Moog recordings, it was yeah. very, 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 yeah, as you say, very labor intensive, incredible. Exactly, yeah. Well, why the flute? What attracted you to that? 
It happened to be the instrument in the household. <laughs> <laughs> was anybody else playing instruments in your household? My mom, my, actually, my mom had grown up playing piano, but we didn't have a piano in the household while I was growing up. But she had found a flute, and I mean a cheap flute. It was like a $100 flute in a, I think it was an antique store. Huh. She bought it thinking she was going to learn to play it, and I don't think she ever picked it up. And I found it in the attic. And she had gotten the very first, like one of those beginner band method books that you have in beginning band, which basically says this is a treble clef and this is a C, this is middle C, this is how you finger it on the flute, this is a D, this is how you finger it, this is how a meter works. So I use that. I actually taught myself to play from that. And from that book, I went to the second, third, and fourth level. And uh, at some point towards the end of my high school years, there was a teacher who came through um, Maryville, Tennessee, which was the town next to where I grew up. And she was visiting her parents, and my grandparents knew her parents. And she said, I'm going to teach a few lessons. So if you know anyone, my grandfather came to me and said, there's someone who's actually te teaching some flute lessons if you want to take lessons. And so I went to see this lady. Uh, Jan Flickinger is her name. She now is uh, Jan Vinci is her married name. And I had a few lessons, and I said, look, I'm interested in majoring in music. And much to her credit, she didn't discourage me, even though I hadn't been playing very long, and I was effectively self-taught at that point. But she said, here's what you need to do. Learn these three pieces, and you can audition for colleges. And she also pointed me towards a high school flute camp that had been set up by Judith Bentley, the lady who eventually became my teacher, at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. They had a high school flute camp, which I think was actually a, a recruitment tool to get kids to come to the college. Now, Jan had studied at Bowling Green and knew Mrs. Bentley, and so I went up the summer before my senior year and attended one week of this flute camp. It was like a boot camp for flute players. <laughs> you got put in like little ensembles like flute quartet, and you kind of learned some basic things about embouchure, and it was an amazing experience. I could tell right off the bat that that teacher, Judith Bentley, was just phenomenal. So that's where I ended up doing my undergrad, and Judith Bentley is the person who got me started on composing. That's unbelievable. I know, it's quite <laughs> I mean, it's incredible that you were able to teach yourself to the degree that you were able to go to college. It's, it's unlike, did you feel like you had this burning passion for the flute? Just, yeah. Yeah? I think it was for flute and it was also just music in general because the fact is when I arrived in college, I knew really nothing. I knew a couple of pieces on the flute, but I knew no aspects of theory. I'd had no ear training. I had no keyboard skills. And so, in effect, I was basically starting at the very bottom. All the remedial classes, they test you when you go into the school, and they place you according to your ability. And I had, like, zero ability. <laughs> I could play the flute, but when I think about it, I knew absolutely nothing. I didn't even know any of the standard repertoire. I didn't know the Beethoven symphonies. I knew no Mozart, no Brahms, no Schumann, basically nothing at all. So it's much to Judith Bentley's credit that she didn't discourage me because now knowing what I didn't know, it's stunning that I even thought I could be a music major. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask, at, at any point, did you ever feel intimidated? It sounds like your, your teachers were incredibly encouraging, but did you ever feel discouraged just on your own? I did. You know, I have to say I felt there were times where I felt overwhelmed and I thought, is there any way I can actually possibly catch up? Because it was obvious that all of my classmates and this is at a state university, believe it or not. So we're not even talking a place like Curtis where the kids come in and they're phenomenal. But even at Bowling Green, I felt a little overwhelmed. But the thing was, I loved music so much. I was willing to kind of push forward and try to learn as much as I could. And as I was going through all the various degrees in college, the entire time I was in school, I was always kind of behind. I was always trying to catch up. So believe it or not, Hugh, even though I have a Pulitzer now, I am still, <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to plug the holes in my knowledge because sometimes I'm writing pieces and I have to explore the repertoire of a given instrument to truly understand what people have done before me. I mean, I did that with a violin concerto. I didn't really know any violin concertos. Oh, my goodness. So I had to really like sit down and study so it's kind of fascinating for me in a way. I'm still learning just by the experience of exploring repertoire I don't know, attempting to write pieces for instruments I'm not used to writing for. I'm getting ready to do a tuba concerto, so I'm about to tackle the tuba concerto repertoire. Wow. But in a way, it also keeps it fresh. 
uh, that's the, that's the advantage. And I have kind of a maturity I can come bring to the experience of learning this repertoire now. Now, tell me again about how you got started as a composer. One of your teachers had encouraged you. Uh, what what gave her the idea that you should pursue to pursue composition? It's a good question. Actually, it was Judith Bentley. I came in one day to a lesson, and she said, listen, Harvey Solberger is coming to Bowling Green, and he's going to do a flute master class. And so I said, all right, what do I need to learn? What piece do I need to prepare? And she says, well, actually, I would like for you to write a piece. <laughs> and I said, how do you do that? <laughs> she was very sweet. She said, look, let's take six notes. I think she thought I wasn't advanced enough for 12 notes. <laughs> She said, let's take six notes and make a little ostinato, and you can kind of build a piece on that. So I did this little two-minute piece for flute and piano called Night Creatures. I didn't know at the time that Harvey Solberger was not only a flute player but also a composer. Mm. But I think I must have said something in my lessons that triggered this response from her because I didn't – I don't remember coming in and saying – Oh, Mrs. Bentley, I really want to compose. But I had to have said something. I mean, she had a sixth sense about students, about how to guide them. And so that was kind of the beginning. That was like my opus one. Although I have to admit it's so bad, it probably should be my opus minus five. I don't think, I, 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 th- I think I remember reading through that. It was actually a remarkable, incredible piece. I can't believe that was your first piece. <laughs> I know. It's kind of, it's kind of fascinating. But you know, that's it was only it took that one experience for me to say, oh, this is kind of cool, arranging sounds on a page and then handing that over to another musician and saying, Can you play this and seeing what it sounds like? Because that basically started me on a path. I continued my degree in performance. I actually finished it, but eventually the composition just took more and more of my time. So it was inevitable, kind of a natural sort of, I don't know, growth into the the world of composition. And I'm wondering, it sounds like in some ways you had a natural advantage. Yeah. Even though you had been so behind and started so late, you had a unique perspective on all the repertoire and the musical, the classical music culture in general. You weren't indoctrinated to be locked in to a certain way of playing or a certain way of listening. That's you, right. You came at it with completely fresh ears, didn't you? And, yeah, that's and actually I have found when I have students come in who have studied music all their lives, they're sometimes very intimidated to write their first string quartet because they're so aware of all the repertoire that they can't kind of get out. They worry about writing a masterpiece. We call it masterpiece syndrome. Uh. So the fact that I didn't have all of the weight of this repertoire on my shoulders did make it easier for me to think outside the box and to approach things from a different perspective. So even though I was getting training in, say, theory and such, I was forever learning, and I think I was so overwhelmed that it caused me not to try to follow the same trail as probably many of my predecessors. Um, When you think about, you know, you study counterpoint, and then you you try to write these works, but if you're so aware of so much of the repertoire, it can be overwhelming. In fact, I remember reading about Brahms making a comment once that they were starting to issue when he was working, I, I think these giant volumes of all the composers had come before him, and he actually wondered if this would be a dangerous thing for composers. Mm. Would it be too much information for them? And would they not be able to kind of make their own voice? Because that's what a composer wants. You want to make your own voice. So overexposure to great music can be a curse in some ways. I think so. I actually think I sometimes wonder with uh, composers who become conductors and then try to go back and compose if they don't suffer from this sort of thing. I often think about Leonard Bernstein. I think his strongest work was one of the earlier ones, West Side Story. But the longer he conducted, the more that other music floated in his head. I think it became very difficult for him to step out from under the weight of all the repertoire that he had to learn to conduct. And the fear of living up to the expectations of other people, the history of past composers, critics, and all that, right? Right. It's a pretty heavy burden to have in a creative mind. Well, one of the most difficult things that all composers face, especially new ones, is getting people to play and appreciate their works. I'm wondering if you could share some advice as to how you eventually became one of the most prolific and commissioned composers in the field today. Well, it's kind of funny. I've I've never advertised. Even though I publish my own stuff, I've never advertised. I get asked about that quite a bit. And I find it... um, 
I guess I had a very naive kind of approach in the early days. My thought was, well, if the music's good enough, the performers will talk to each other <laughs> and say, oh, you should check out the piece, which ironically, it's actually kind of how it happened. How fascinating. Yeah. So it's a kind of a word of mouth. I mean, I'm forever encountering people who say, how is it I've never heard your music before? And <laughs> it's because basically I get stuff played by orchestras, but sometimes their first experience is hearing a piece of mine in an orchestral setting, or they happen to have heard something of mine on Sirius Satellite Radio. They often broadcast my music on that station. Sure. But um, the biggest thing for a composer is getting to know performers. Mm. And having had the opportunity to go to a place like the Curtis Institute of Music is incredible because there are all these amazing performers there. And these are oftentimes the people who are going out into the world they basically, as a composer, you have to have performers who are your advocates. And sometimes you just get to know them kind of while you're in school. They go out, everyone graduates, they get a career started. And then when they get the opportunity to play some new music or to commission something, they tend to think back, first of all, the people who are their classmates in school. And so you get contacted. So when I think about some of the commissions I've done, like I did a bluegrass concerto for Time for Three, and for those guys, I knew all of them when they were at Curtis. Same for Hilary Hahn's violin concerto. She was in a class I taught at Curtis. Yes. So you start off if you're a performer, composer, writing for yourself. But this also kind of spreads to the people you went to school with or performers that you might know. And if the music resonates with a the performer, they get excited about it. And they have a tendency to want to do it more. And they also have a tendency to want to tell other people about it. So the music has to resonate with the people hearing it and playing it. And that's that's something you can't describe how to achieve that because this may be a different answer for every single composer. Absolutely. But that's, that's certainly that I think there are elements of connection. Not right. only the the not only the social networking per se or the professional networking, but even the musical networking, making the connections with other musicians and caring about making music that reaches other people rather than writing music just for yourself or just in isolation. Correct. Absolutely. And, you know, when I think about it, I think Beethoven and Mozart and Brahms, all those guys, Bach, they were very aware that their music was being written for others. I mean, people say, well, how can you write for others? I'm like, well, you write to communicate. So you want to make sure that the music is communicating with others. You have to be true to yourself, but you also have to find a way to make that your true voice sing to others, actually speak to others. And I'm wondering if your your childhood listening to more popular works hasn't really helped you also speak with a musical language that resonates with people more really on, on a level that they understand rather than people who have been so deeply steeped in high literature from childhood, yeah, whether maybe your rock and folk and pop background has actually helped you. It actually has helped because I realized that my sense of timing and when to, to create color change and, um, a need for a clear pulse, and I'm sure that's from being around all the pop music. Um, I think those things, my brain may be wired to make ideas turn over faster, which because I think we live in a world where we all hear music all the time, even in just the most random places and restaurants and banks and even standing out waiting, you know, on a subway platform, you just hear music everywhere. There's like no escaping it. That in itself wires a listener's head to have expectations of their music that they listen to. And so what I think has happened is because my brain was trained in a faster moving music that tends to get to the point quicker because it is popular music. I think my expectations when I'm writing have kind of been filtered through that's like wearing a special kind of glasses. So I think that's actually true. <laughs> I wonder if we shouldn't have curriculum in classical music conservatories to force people to get more familiar with pop music. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting idea. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, a, maybe a rock history class of some sort. Yeah, absolutely. Why yeah. not? <laughs> in a sense, it's all music, and music is music. You know, that's yeah. the thing. Yeah. It's either good music or not good music. <laughs> it, no matter the genre, no matter how how popular it is, in a sense, in in terms of its commercial success. But great music is great music. That's right. Absolutely. Now, I, I'm wondering if we could step back a little bit and talk about the other side of the, the the life of a composer. You know, we've mentioned that you're one of the most performed and I should say one of the most beloved living composers today. But you, you're also a very astute businesswoman. You've mentioned that you you 
print and publish and distribute your own music rather than have it distributed through a big name music publisher. Right. I'm wondering what made you decide to follow the independent business model rather than seeking after the prestige of being a part of some major publisher's catalog? Well, there were a couple of events that happened that convinced me that this was the better route. I remember when I was doing my undergraduate studies at Bowling Green, they have a new music festival that happens annually. And during my junior or senior year, Philip Glass was the primary composer wow. that year who was featured. So they did quite a bit of his music. I remember there was a reception at the dean's house at the end of the festival, and all the composers were gathered around Mr. Glass and we asked him, he said, what does it take to be a professional composer? And he, I remember this very clearly, him saying, keep the rights to your pieces. Don't let anyone take your copyright away. Most people don't know that if you sign on with a publishing house, they take the copyright of your music. You don't own it anymore. I see. Oh, boy. Yeah. So it's a that's a pretty serious thing, which means they can license the music out. But it also means if you need a copy of the music, you have to buy it from them. Oh. My and goodness. They, I know. And they take most of the, the money. So Philip Glass had figured this out pretty early on because he had his own ensemble. And at the time, I think he was publishing his own music. Um, but I remember that later on when I was coming out of grad school, I actually at one point sent out a whole bunch of my music to a couple of the publishers, some of the big ones. And they all said, no, thank you. <laughs> so, so there was a thing of necessity there. I thought, well, people are asking me for the music, so I'll just sell it. But around that time, computers were starting to become big, and the music notation programs themselves were starting to kind of come in vogue. They were in the early stages of development. We were also, at the same time, starting to get these, these big stores like Office Max and Staples, so places where you could buy supplies. And the printers for the computers were getting more sophisticated, so at the time I was coming out of grad school, it became obvious that I was going to need to handle the music myself. And I had the options because I had a computer and I had printers and I could buy, you know, the envelopes for shipping and stuff. I could buy the binding equipment. I could actually buy the coils. You could buy the machines. So kind of all these things hitting at the same time made it possible for me to fill orders. Now, in the early days, I'd get like one order a month or something. <laughs> usually it was a flute piece, and usually it was someone I knew. So I kind of learned the publishing business over the years, encountering all these different circumstances. So in the early days, it was literally one order a month. But that started to pick up after a couple of years. And then I started looking at, all right, what do people charge for scores? There were instances where I was still playing flute and I had trouble getting music from a publishing house. For instance, I remember at one point I was playing an Elliott Carter piece for the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center and we couldn't get the music from Boozy and Hawks, his publisher. Oh, no. Elliott Carter is a pretty big... Yeah. He's not an unknown composer, but we couldn't get them to give us the music. So it's one of those situations where if you have enough of those kinds of instances, you realize, wait a minute, the publishing houses are supposed to be assisting us to get the music out there into the world, but I was having so much trouble getting hold of the music. So there was a point where I thought, you know what, maybe I should just hang on to this stuff. Should I just should take care of it. The volume is low enough. I can handle it. I've got the equipment. I've assembled it, and I can just print on demand. So what happened through the years is the number of orders built up month by month. To the point where now I have a full-time employee who actually handles all of this because we get four to five orders a day. Oh, my goodness. Of music. So it's a pretty heavy volume. And the, the equipment has become sophisticated enough that you can actually print quite a bit of music pretty easily on demand and bind it and send it out. But um, now that I'm doing this, I see that the publishers take a lot of the money. And I remember reading now Beethoven and Mozart had this problem. Mozart actually tried to self-publish. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Lifetime. Yeah. He actually tried to get a subscri subscription service going where people could have the music once he finished writing it, but he couldn't get enough people signed on. <laughs> so believe it or not. But I know oh. Beethoven also struggled with the publishers as well because most people don't know this, but the publishers take about 90% of the cover price. Whoa, 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 90%. Yes. Nine zero. And Nine you're zero. and the composers are left with 10%? Ten, yes. yes. How is that how is that permissible? <laughs> well, it's been it's I think it's been like that forever. This oh, is my music goodness. sales. Yeah, it's been like this pretty much forever. They also take half of your performance royalties. So in a certain sense, 
for business reasons, it's actually smarter to handle it. If you're organized enough, it's smart. It's smarter to handle it yourself because you can actually make a living as a composer. Uh, as opposed to oh, that is, I, I never realized that the margins were that detrimental. It's it's pretty extreme, and it's it has been that way. I think even since Beethoven and Mozart's time, it hasn't really changed. Mm. So it's not it's not been an ideal situation for composers trying to make a living, which is why a lot of composers, I think, have full time teaching jobs, because the fact of the matter is, unless you figured something out, the odds of you being able to make a living as a composer are slim to none. Yeah. But you're uh, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing, because I know composers, the, the, the different revenue streams are commissions. You get paid right. to write a work. But, of right. course, in your situation, you're also selling and renting scores. That's right. I'm right. wondering if you – are you able to – are you feel comfortable to share the approximate proportions of, of where – how much – Income yeah. do you get from sales and rentals? How much do you get yeah, from commissions? Yeah, I, I can yeah. make a guess at it. Now Cheryl handles all of this. Cheryl handles the publishing. So, But if I had to guess, I'd say that probably 60% of my income comes from publishing. And I would say probably 30 to 35% is commission. And the rest are small fees. I teach two hours a week at Curtis. And then there sometimes there are fees for coming in and speaking at universities. So the majority of my income probably actually is the publishing itself. Which is remarkable because that's what you can control directly. Right. Correct. Amazing. And I it, It's I, interesting, isn't it though? I mean, you know, most people think composers, and this is for all ours, they think they just go off and they they work and they're inspired. But the truth of the matter is it, it, and it's always been the case. There is a business aspect to it. If you want to get paid to make any kind of money, you have to really think about how you're going to do that. There's no getting around it one way or the other. And it's never been a case where anyone can get around it. You have to think about it very seriously. And in your case, it's a wonderful example that the business does not detract from the art. It's. It, right. many, I think many artists are trained to think, oh, well, I, I just want to focus on my music. I don't want to think about that business stuff. Correct. You're right. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. Uh, this, it's, it's, thank you so much for sharing that information. I think a lot of artists and a lot of composers are going to have their eyes really opened to the reality of how to make a living. It's kind of fascinating. And it, and it surprises me. And it's not something I would ever heard about when I was in school. Uh, so to have learned through the years, exactly. I mean, even now, I had a business call today trying to figure out how to collect foreign royalties on recordings because there's no system set up at all. If you're an American and you have recordings go out into the world and they get sold in Europe and Asia, unless you get a lawyer or a special person who goes after the people who collect those royalties, you're never going to see any, any oh of the money God. at all. So it goes into somebody's pocket, but then you just have to figure out what you have to do to make sure it's your pocket and not someone else's pocket. I'd like to jump a little bit into memory lane. I'm wondering if you can recall your very first CD project that you and I actually worked on together, <laughs> Rapid Fire. Can you tell, right. you tell me about that project, how it came to fruition, and if you have any fun stories to share from our time together in New York recording that wonderful debut album? That was an amazing experience. <laughs> I actually found the – there was a call for scores on – what used to be the American Music Center, it's now New Music USA, it was a composer collective that would post um, in a newsletter, in a printed newsletter that they would send to you opportunities, competitions you could enter. And one month I got the newsletter and it said, looking for composers who perform on their instruments, who are interested in being recorded. And I thought, well, that looks kind of interesting. So I, I wrote the guy who had posted the, the, uh, the advertisement and said, I play flute. And sure, I'd love to record some of my things. And he was trying to start a label of music that was performed by composers themselves. That's how this came about. Uh, it was called E Virtuosi. Yeah. It was his own label. And so he said, look, I'll pay. I'll actually pay for the recording. <laughs> he said, I want to come play, and we'll just do an entire CD of your music. So we kind of looked at what I had written up to that point, and we had some flute stuff, some flute and piano, flute quartet. And um, if I remember correctly, we did also a viola sonata. That's right. We did. That's right. So it was an amazing experience, my first experience. What an intimate way to learn about recording, to actually be playing on the recording, but also to have your friends and colleagues 
join you in that process. And it was really educational for me. I mean, I was like learning the entire way, but I was also kind of blown away that somebody would make this offer. And after the the album came out, I remember people were saying to me, this was the early days of CDs. I mean, there were tons of CDs out at that point. My composer colleagues were like, how did you find this? And I said, well, it was just a regular listing in the very same newsletter we all look at. (laughs) You you had the advantage of being able to play your own instrument. That's it. And I also realized sometimes you really have to sit down and read through the opportunities because some of my colleagues actually played instruments, but somehow they had just scanned the newsletter and had not really registered that this was something they could have submitted something for. So that's an interesting thing unto itself. I mean, you would think, you would absolutely think that they would have noticed it, but it was an opportunity to, because, you know, a CD is kind of a calling card, too. It is. Suddenly I had music that I could send out the radio stations. If if I was traveling to a university and I was doing a residency and they said, oh, look, we've got a local station. Let's uh, let's actually see if we can play something yours. And I was lucky because I had, like, you playing on the recording, (laughs) which was just absolutely a phenomenal experience, but it was a lot of fun. It so was. What a great thing. It was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things that struck me while working with you for the very first time for that project was how open you were to suggestions and changes. I, I think I recall a passage that was particularly difficult to play. Yeah. And I asked you if you wouldn't mind rewriting it again to make it easier for me to navigate. Absolutely. And you were more than happy to accommodate and so welping, welcoming for the feedback. Yeah, you it, know, it, that's that's an ideal thing for a composer. I still kind of stay open about, even now, I've noticed when we were doing the opera last summer, if people are telling me who are experts in performing their instruments or singing, if they're talking to me about a difficulty, it's in my interest, best interest really to figure out a way to accommodate that request. Because the fact is, you know a piano much better than I would. Hmm. A singer would know the voice and what is awkward. It's just as, as a flute player, when I was playing other composers' work, sometimes I realized there was something that might work a little better if it was fingered differently, if there was a different articulation. Yes. So always being open as an artist, you can always say, look, this is not what I want to do, but staying open has taught me more about writing for instruments and even working with people like you and observing what is difficult versus what sits well on the keyboard. It's the best thing for the composer in reality. And it makes us <laughs> love you and your music more because you're so easygoing, so easy to work with, as opposed to other composers who are very rigid and very demanding, saying, no, this is the way it has to be. Figure it out. <laughs> I know. You know, the thing is, you're not really compromising your your art form by making those adjustments. I mean, even last weekend when I was in Boston doing the mixing, I was kind of surprised that the engineer was telling me that they had had nightmare situations with people who couldn't basically figure out how to describe what they wanted, but they were also being extraordinarily difficult. Yes. And sometimes you have to trust the people around you. They're experts. They know what they're doing. You know, find out what they think might work and actually step back and consider it because what you may have thought worked doesn't truly work. And so being open and available to have that dialogue, it's in everybody's interest and you'll end up with a better end product than reality. Hmm. I'd like to step back and get back to the work you first mentioned, the very first work, which was Blue Cathedral. You wrote this in memory of your younger brother, Andrew Blue Higdon, who died from skin cancer in 1998. I, I don't know. If you're not comfortable about this, please let me oh, know. No, I'm, I'm fine talking about you it. Know, it's I, no problem. I, I, I'm wondering if you could tell me about Andrew. Tell me about him and, and the ways that you describe him in that piece. Yeah, Andy and I were really close. It was kind of amazing. We were a year and a half apart in age. And that's like a very fantastic kind of relationship as a sibling, because you see the whole world through your sibling's eyes. Also, you are always having interactions, you play together. And so it was interesting. I lost him. It was very quick. It was skin cancer. And it was like seven weeks from his diagnosis to his death. Oh my goodness. And so I remember when Gary Grafman called me about writing this piece for Curtis it was about, it was not long after Andy had passed away, and I was still kind of processing losing him so quickly. It was a, it was the kind of loss that really marks you, that you really just feel to the depth of your, your soul. Yes. And I had originally thought I was going to write kind of a fast-moving, upbeat piece because it was supposed to be celebratory. But the more I thought about Curtis and the more I thought about the kids who go to school there, I thought about the fact that these people are, they they become important to you as you move out into the world, that they're 
their colleagues, but their colleagues in a very dear endeavor, creating music. And so when I was thinking about my brother, Andy, I was thinking about the fact that here's this guy. I remember when he was, he was dying. We were all living in a house together in Virginia Beach. His friends were coming from Baltimore, basically to say goodbye and to see him. And I was so touched by the number of people who came in and were having these interactions with Andy. And I thought, wow, our interactions are so important that we have in life. And that's what music is. That's what chamber music is when you're playing an orchestra. And so that really made an impression on me. And I decided to write basically a tone poem that kind of commemorates those interactions, but also commemorates just Andy and the fact that we all touch other people's lives. It's the very thing you want to do when you're, you're writing music, performing music. You want to touch the audience. You want to touch the performers. And so I decided to write this tone poem, and I feature a lot of flute solos because I'm a flute player and clarinet solos because Andy played clarinet in high school band. Oh, okay. So there's an interaction between those two lines throughout. And I actually have the, the flute solo comes in first because I was the older sibling. And then the clarinet comes in because Andy came after me. And so it's kind of a dialogue that goes on throughout. But I also, in the middle section, kind of one of the slower sections, I have a lot of solos for individual players. And that was kind of a tribute to the players at Curtis. So there's like an English horn solo, viola solo, cello solo, piccolo solo. I put a lot of those in because I thought what a special experience Curtis is. We all like do our lessons there. We do individual practice. We play in chamber groups and we also play in orchestra. And I wanted to kind of set up a dialogue that reflected that. So that piece, in, in essence, and I think it also was very cathartic for me. I have to admit, while I was writing it, I think I was trying to decide whether life was going to be about living or if it was going to be about dying. Mm -hmm. I was really trying to process the loss of Andrew. And so you can hear the point in the piece where I decided life was going to be about living. It's where the fanfare is. It's about two-thirds of the way, three-quarters of the way through the piece. It's kind of a soaring thing. I also imagined a cathedral in the sky. I'm not sure if this grew out of the fact that my brother had lived on Cathedral Street. I didn't make this connection <laughs> recently. Mm. And I was thinking about his middle name, Blue, and the color of the sky. And it was just a bunch of loose thoughts that were floating around. But it kind of shows how the subconscious assembles a piece as if it were a puzzle, interestingly enough. So at this all came together. It kind of coalesced into a, a piece with a dialogue that features flute and clarinet and also features solos. And I decided at the end to add these little bell sounds, these tiny little bell sounds, because I was imagining flying up through the cathedral ceiling and going up towards the stars. Because wow. I thought Andy's journey is going on ahead of me. Yes. So, and in fact, the clarinet solo is the one that's at the end there. The flute kind of goes out because Andy was kind of going on in his journey. Yeah. So as you can tell, it's a very personal piece. But in essence, even though I wrote it, I feel like now the piece has gone out into the world. It gets done so much. And it really touches me, people's reactions to the work. I've been deeply moved by the letters and emails I get, and even people coming up to me at performances. You can tell it has really hit something because we all experience loss at some point. This is not an uncommon conversation. Yeah. And I feel like the piece, in essence, kind of belongs to everyone at this point, which is exactly how Andy would have liked it. He would have absolutely loved that. So it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to share with the world. What a beautiful lens through which you as an artist look at these little details, these small minutiae of life to craft something cohesive and beautiful to turn back to the world, to experience, re-experience your feelings and your thoughts. Right, right. And, and the artistic lens, it's so, so, it's so impactful. Thank you so much for that. Quite welcome, quite welcome. I'm, it, we can touch on... Your violin concerto. You yes. won the Pulitzer Prize in 2010, and this concerto was premiered by Hilary Hahn, who we both knew at Curtis. Can you, if you don't mind, would you describe the concerto and tell us what you were trying to convey through it? And of course, with the Pulitzer Prize, how has that changed your life? <laughs> Holy cow. It's a, a big, that's a big, it, hey, that prize really kind of adjusts everything in your life. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> it was fun to write for Hillary, but it was also very intimidating because she told me right up front she was going to be recording it with a Tchaikovsky violin concerto. And I thought, oh my gosh. This, <laughs> that's a, that's Ma kind of, <laughs> masterpiece intimidation syndrome, anybody? Exactly. That's exactly. And I remember asking Hillary, what 
what do you want in your piece? And she says, oh, I just want a major piece. And I said, well, what does that mean? <laughs> what do, how do you define a major piece? Yes. And she says she thought just something that was like 30 minutes. And I thought, well, I guess that's a starting point. <laughs> <laughs> so I often design pieces around the performers, kind of their personalities. And I remember the piece I wrote right before this was actually a bluegrass concerto for the time for three guys. And that piece is kind of fun. It's very different. But Hillary is a pretty serious player. And the repertoire she picks for herself tends to be very traditional repertoire. So I made the decision to write a violin concerto that follows kind of a standard three-movement format. I it very loosely, a fast movement, a slow movement, and a fast movement. <laughs> so once you make that decision, it's just a matter of going off and looking at a lot of concertos and figuring out how to handle solo violin against an orchestra without covering the violin. Because it's one thing to write a percussion concerto where you're banging on drums, because you're going to hear that no matter what. You'll see the the player banging on the drums, <laughs> but to actually get a lyrical line on the violin and not cover it up with the orchestra is a delicate balancing act. Yes. And I thought about Hillary's personality. And when she was taking her class with me, uh, the 20th century music class at Curtis, which is about history and theory, I think she had just recorded um, Edgar Meyer's violin concerto along with the Samuel Barber violin concerto. And I remember that was a phenomenal recording and the Barber Violin Concerto has a lot of lyricism in it and a very fast movement. So I thought, all right, obviously the last movement needs to be just flying like crazy. And I wanted to also focus on the gorgeousness of her tone, her control. So the middle movement is intentionally slow. I wrote the movements out of order. I wasn't, I was so nervous. I thought, I don't know what idea is going to stand out in my imagination when I'm starting this. Usually the hardest thing is starting a piece because you've got to find the harmonic language that fits that particular project. So I came up with a chord progression and I knew right away it was supposed to be the slow movement. So I wrote the slow movement first hmm. and it's made up of a chaconne, actually two chaconnes, which are chord progressions that kind of repeat irregularly and you write lines over it basically. So it kind of helped structure the thing. So I wrote a slow lyrical movement. And again, it had a lot of solos in it for Hillary to interact with various players in the orchestra. So there's like an English horn solo and a trumpet solo. And I decided to use some chamber settings. So Hillary playing with string quartet or a sextet. And that grew, grew out of the fact that it was the Indianapolis Symphony that was premiering it. And I happened to know the concertmaster, Zach the Pugh, had also been in one of my classes <laughs> At Curtis, so I thought, well, it'd be nice to allow some of the principal players to play along with Hillary. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And it was just having those kinds of random thoughts made some of the decisions because the idea of having a solos play in a chamber format is very different. It doesn't normally occur in a concerto, but it seemed like such a natural thing. So I wrote the slow movement. I sent it off to Hillary, where she was traveling in the world, and I heard back from her about a week later. And she said. Sounds great, but you can write stuff that's harder. I'm like, okay, well, you know, <laughs> all right, I'll write something harder. So the next movement I wrote was actually the third movement, the final movement, and it was around the time of the Olympics in China. It was the Summer Olympics, and I remember seeing footage of all the various runners and the people who were doing all these incredible things. And I, in my head, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if Hillary were running across a finish line with like a violin <laughs> in one hand or a bow in the other? You know, she's crossing the tape. And so that gave me the idea to write basically a fast-moving scherzo-type movement um, for her just to basically be like Hillary running the Olympics. That was, the <laughs> that was actually the idea. So I wrote it, and it's it's pretty tricky, and I sent it off to her. A week went by, and she wrote back and said, this looks great. It's hard, but you can still make it harder. Oh, ooh. <laughs> ooh. It's like I'm throwing the gauntlet down. Wow. So I, all right, now i got to write the first move. And I thought, what is really hard on a violin? What is not very unviolinistic? And I thought, wide leaps on the fingerboard. So the whole first movement are these unbelievable double stops where your fingers are really stretching to reach them. So you're playing two notes at once. 
and moving quickly between those, it's not a very natural thing. So that's what I did in the first movement. It basically features wide leaps on the fingerboard and is all over the place. I sent it off to Hillary, and there was like two weeks that went by, and I didn't hear anything. <laughs> she said, wow, this is pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, okay, so now I've challenged Hillary. And in fact, it has a cadenza in there that when I first wrote it, I thought, there's no way. I don't think this is even playable. And I even sent a little note to Hillary and said, look, if this is not playable, I will – I will write you another cadenza. And she said, it's pretty darn hard, but it's my job to learn it. So I'll do it. And she Ooh. plays the heck out of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of incredible. When the piece was first premiered, people were like, Oh my gosh, no one is going to be able to play this besides Hillary. But miraculously five other violinists have done it. How about that? How it's, about which that? is amazing, especially yeah. for a brand new concerto that was just premiered in 2009. It's, yeah. it's incredible that it actually gets done as much as it does. So. <laughs> Little little background story. You had written out a piano reduction That's part right. for that concerto, and Hillary and I, <laughs> Hillary had asked me if we could run through it a lot of times. <laughs> so I actually helped her helped her practice and learn that concerto thanks to you and the piano part that you wrote out. I think I did that with your oboe concerto also. That's right. right? Absolutely. Yeah. You've actually kind of like made it easier for me to do my job. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, I, I laugh. I will, I will never forget the day the Pulitzer happened. I was like kind of in shock. You know, they don't notify you in advance. You find out because the press descends on you. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's a little overwhelming. And, you know, it's the shock of hearing you've won the Pulitzer from a press member who wants you to say something intelligent when you're probably <laughs> your least intelligent. Because <laughs> it's, it's so hard to comprehend. But it's amazing how that experience got the piece out there, got people curious about it. But I, my most famous joke about that is, you know, everybody returns your call after you've won a Pulitzer. If you call them about doing a composition <laughs> project, that's the difference in your life. People return your calls after that. <laughs> <laughs> that is so awesome I and guess. so wonderfully well-deserved. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> uh, well, one final thing uh, I wanted to touch on the fact that you've just finished your first opera, Cold Mountain, right. based on the novel by Charles Frazier. Now, it had its premier performance with the Santa Fe Opera in August of 2015 and it's scheduled to be performed, as you mentioned, with the Opera Company of Philadelphia this coming February 2016. Now, this was a massive work. It took you two hours, as I understand, of composing eight hours a day. Two years, actually, two, yeah. A two yeah, year, yeah. A two yeah. years of composing eight hours a day, sorry. And, I, uh, I wish it was two hours. That uh, was, I, I, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> two hours. Two years of composing eight hours a day. Now, for folks who have never been to an opera, can you tell us what's the premise of the story? Yeah, it's a fascinating novel. I'm try, the biggest thing was trying to get it down to a two-and-a-half-hour opera. That was my rule from the very start. It could not be a long opera. But basically what happens is we have a Confederate soldier who has been in war for four years. He's tired of killing. He's been injured. He realizes this isn't really his war. He shouldn't be fighting this, and he wants to go home. So he walks. He starts walking back from a hospital in Richmond, Virginia, back to Coal Mountain. And Coal Mountain, there's actually a real Coal Mountain, is located at the westernmost part of the edge of North Carolina. Oh, wow. So in his journey going back, he runs into all kinds of people who basically are trying to kill him. <sighs> and it's everyone from people who are trying to capture AWOL soldiers to put them back in uh, to serving in the war, because apparently a lot of people were going AWOL at the end of the war, to people who just wanted to kill him believe it or not. It, it's, it's kind of incredible. So it's like the Odyssey. He encounters all these different characters. At the same time that this is happening, the woman he fell in love with before he left, Ada Monroe, she was living in Cold Mountain. She was recently arrived there with her father, who was a preacher, and she was not raised to take care of herself. Uh, she was kind of raised only by her father. Her mother passed away in childbirth, and he dies Early on, I think they were only a couple months into the war or maybe a year into the war, and she doesn't know how to take care of herself. She's really struggling to survive. The farm, everything is running wild. She doesn't even know how to bake or cook. And so another lady who lives on the mountain named Ruby, who has really had to raise herself, comes in and offers to help on the farm, to help her survive, to help grow crops. And so 
Ada doesn't know whether Inman's ever coming back. So she takes on this, this helper who's actually kind of like a business partner, Ruby, and they work the farm trying to basically get by during a, a point of deprivation, really, where everyone is really suffering. And so Inman's trying to get back. And the opera is the two of them waiting for each other. Inman thinks he's so damaged he doesn't think he's, he's worth loving anymore. And he's worried Ada won't remember him. So he's having all these encounters, trying to stay alive. He's walking back. And towards the end of the opera, he actually gets back to Cold Mountain. And Ada doesn't recognize him at first. Oh, don't give the ending away. <laughs> don't give the ending away. <laughs> but it is an exquisite story for opera because people fall in love and people die. <laughs> there are people scenes because we've got soldiers. We have lots of soldiers. We have Confederate soldiers. We have federal soldiers. And there are a lot of characters, and it's it's really it turned out to be an ideal opera subject. It's amazing how well it works, and because I grew up on pop music, and my sensibility that I want things to happen fast, I make the opera move at a really fast clip. So there are not drawn out scenes at all. You don't have long arias or duets. There are lots of different combinations of the voices, but I make everything move very quickly. So it's like two hours and 25 minutes, and it goes through something like 25 scenes in the wow. opera. So, I mean, they move along in a real clip. I think the scenes all run around three or four minutes, which is about the equivalent of a pop song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this actually goes back to kind of the way my brain is wired from having grown up on this sort of thing. But incredibly in Santa Fe, all five performances were sold out. They added a sixth performance, and that also sold out for the first wow. time in the history of the opera company. The wow. added sold out. And the tickets in Philadelphia have been selling at a real clip. They're selling better than the standard repertoire. That's fantastic. I mean, it sounds like this is an ideal opera, it particularly is. for folks who have never been to the opera before. Wouldn't That's you right. And I also wrote it, so if you haven't read the novel, you don't have to worry about it. You can totally follow what's going on, even without that perspective. So it's it's an audience-friendly opera. And uh, it's come and hear it and really experience it. And it's not like anything you can ever imagine. It's pretty dramatic. One final question. What inspired you to use that novel for your source material? Well, you know, I grew up not far from Cold Mountain. I actually didn't realize that. I read the book and I was like, oh, this this feels familiar. This feels right. And so I started the process of getting the rights to set it. And I started reading the book over and over again. I read it through like four times in a row, trying to get a sense of the pacing and the characters. And one of the times I was looking at the front of the book, there's actually a map there of where coal, the actual Coal Mountain is located. I started looking at it, and I suddenly realized that the farm I grew up on, East Tennessee, was not that far from Coal Mountain. So I got out Google Earth. I opened <laughs> it up, and I looked. And in fact, it's very close. The farm I was on is on the far eastern side of the border of the state, and Coal Mountain's on the far western side of North Carolina. If a crow was flying from the farm I lived on over to Cold Mountain, it'd be about 60 miles. Oh, my goodness. So I, I recognized all these characters. I recognized all of them. I recognized the speech patterns, the, just the characteristics, the way they thought. And it's because I lived on a farm not that far from there. It's amazing how you've drawn on so many rich elements of your own everyday life to bring something incredibly beautiful in everything that you pursue. Right, yeah. Oh, Jennifer, thank you so much for taking the time to talk and share about your life, your art. And it's always been such a privilege to, to, to play your music and, of course, to know you as a friend. Well, thank you, Hugh. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> this episode of A Musical Life has been brought to you by The Shop at A Musical Life. From MP3s to CDs, books and accessories for reading digital sheet music, the online shop at A Musical Life is a great resource for enjoying the stories you hear on this show. You'll find full recordings from most of the excerpts you hear during the interviews, many of which you can purchase and download instantly. 
check out the selection of Jennifer's works mentioned in this episode, including Blue Cathedral from the album Rainbow Body, her percussion concerto performed by Colin Curie and the London Philharmonic, and her Pulitzer Prize-winning violin concerto performed by Hilary Hahn. Your purchase helps to support this show and continue bringing great stories about making music and the things that move our souls. Visit the shop at amusicallife.com forward slash shop. Once again, that link is amusicallife.com forward slash shop. For links to Jennifer's website and recordings, visit the show notes at amusicallife.com. And be sure to leave a comment or send me your feedback by email at stories at amusicallife.com. I'd love to hear from you. If you like this show, tell a friend or share a link on Facebook or Twitter. Be sure to subscribe to A Musical Life through iTunes or Stitcher or with your favorite podcast playing app. And consider posting a review in iTunes by going to amusicallife.com forward slash review. Your iTunes subscriptions and reviews help to share this show with other listeners. So thank you for all your support. Until next time, I'm Hugh Sung, and I wish you a musical life.